my college days, I always wondered what it was like to be the professor instead of the student, the already learned instead of the still learning. Today that fantasy is realized in this glorious Richardson Auditorium, which Princeton has led to me for a brief 15 minutes in order to relay some bits of musical knowledge that I have acquired over my somewhat lengthy career. Without boring you with unnecessary jargon and academic discussions of musical syntax or phonology, I wanted to talk to you about how the need for expression, especially self-expression, altered the scope of the symphony in the 19th and early 20th centuries. In these terrible times, with a pandemic ravaging the global population and leaving major economies in shambles, it might seem rather strange for me to sit here and ponder expression in symphonies. But if there is one truth which I have discovered, it is this. Music has always st stood the passage of time, from plagues and world wars to poverty and segregation, moving countless hearts and enriching numerous lives. I firmly believe that this quality of music will ensure that it continues through any and all adversities. So what do I mean when I say the need for expression and self-expression alter the scope of the symphony post-Beethoven. Well, Beethoven, as we know, is said to have changed the musical world forever with his nine larger-than-life symphonies, which subsequent composers had to almost challenge if they wanted to produce their own symphony. So how did these composers challenge Beethoven, exactly? The mighty Zeus of symphonic writing. Well, I argue that they went about this undertaking with their desire to express an idea, whether that be a fact about life, a personal statement, or even a particular scene, to portray a particular scene, inspired by literature. And one way this desire for expression manifested itself in symphonic writing is through newly added instrumentation. For example, Berlioz, in his programmatic work, The Symphony Fantastique, use peculiar instruments such as church bells and ovoclides to help portray the funeral of an artist who has overdosed on opium due to unrequited love. As the church bells emphasize tonic and dominant, the ovoclides introduce the Dies Irae theme, symbolizing the arrival of the Grim Reaper. On the piano it goes something like this. so forth. While the Symphony Fantastique is clearly programmatic, there is an element of self-expression in it, as Berlioz's inspiration for the work is his own unrequited love for the actress Harriet Smithson. Because of this, there are also moments of incredible pathos in the Symphony Fantastique, like the trance-like music played by the strings in the beginning of the piece. Yet somehow, by the fifth movement, things become gnarly and crude as a solo clarinet portrays the devilish witch's dance at the demented funeral. <laughs> already come such a far away from Mozart and even Beethoven. While Mozart's symphonies are abound with beauty and Beethoven's are charged with triumph, Berlioz's symphony fantastique seems to scream of vulgarity and horror, dismissing the chance of victory and instead replacing it with total and utter chaos. Another expressive device that was integral to the development of the post-Beethovenian symphony is melody. While Beethoven may have been incomparable at structural and motivic development, 
he was perhaps not the greatest melodist, as evidenced by many repeated notes and short phraselets. However, as the Romantic era progressed, a lovely and melodic melody began to be a central part of most symphonies. Only take a listen to the second movement of Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony. so forth. Thank the Lord that composers took on the challenge of writing the symphony after Beethoven, because music like this changes whoever listens to it. The heartbreaking tune not only expresses a personal emotion of Tchaikovsky's, but also forces the listener to remember his or her own painful and locked away memories. In the first movement of Tchaikovsky's fourth, there is another sweeping melody, but which takes on a vastly different character due to its chromaticism. Here it seems as though Tchaikovsky is yearning for something, wanting something, which he desperately cannot have. It goes something like this. Sixteen bars, and he finally seems to reach a breaking point. lines, Tchaikovsky forges melodies which stir a multitude of melancholic emotions, perhaps mirroring his own internal turbulences at the time, including a failed marriage and bouts of depression. So, moving on now. Throughout the Romantic era, the size of the symphony increased tremendously, as new instruments were added to the orchestra and existing ones were modified and given more emphasis. In Mozart and Haydn's time, brass and woodwind instruments were given little more than accompanimental roles, only playing a few notes to highlight the contours of the strings' harmonies. It wasn't really until Tchaikovsky, Brahms, and the other Romantic composers that the brass and woodwinds began to be featured as the solo stars of the orchestra. Beethoven was the first to use a choir in the symphony, vastly expanding, expanding the arsenal of the orchestra. But many years later, it was Gustav Mahler who would unify brass fanfare and choral textures in a way that would produce a truly colossal and monumental sound. Now, Mahler needed a very large orchestra, complete with choir and organ, to realize this larger-than-life expressive potential. Take the Resurrection Symphony, for example. At the end of the piece, Mahler's choir verse shouts, Die shall I in order to live. Rise again, yes, rise again, will you, my heart, in an instant. That for which you suffered, to God will it lead you. Can you imagine this kind of overwhelming emotion played by a Mozartian orchestra? It will be impossible, at the very most unsatisfying. And for those of you who are interested, Listen to the finale as played by the London Symphony Orchestra and the Edinburgh Festival Chorus with myself conducting at the podium. And when you do listen to it, notice the sheer volume of sound being produced. And if you can watch the video, the number of performers on this stage. It's as if Mahler had brought out both the US Army and the Marine Corps to fight a single battle. <laughs> 
A third way that the symphony developed in the 19th and 20th centuries is through an expression of culture. Months before the premiere of the New World Symphony, Dvorak emphasized Native American and African musical folklore as the building blocks of a new American school of musical composition. Now what does he mean by that? Let's take a look at the first movement, where we hear a melody played by the winds. Notice the monotone accompaniment and the narrow melodic range. The accompaniment in the melodic range, which only really ranges a fifth, which give off a primitive texture to the music. It is these two elements which make for music that perhaps sounds as if it were played by a Native American flute, an Indian folk song, if you will. Now, what of the African music style? How might Dvorak have incorporated that culture into his New World Symphony? Well, to answer that, we need only look a few bars later into the symphony. <laughs> similar this melody that I just played is to the African-American spiritual Swing Low Sweet Chariot. But it's interesting to note that both this tune and the previous Indian one sound more Czechoslovakian when Dvorak develops them. In fact, the whole New World Symphony seems to contain more Germanic and Slavic influences than it does of the so-called New World. But regardless of precise ethnic ideas, it is undeniable that Dvorak's Ninth inspired other composers to express, also express, cultural elements in their symphonies. For example, in the Afro-American Afro Symphony, William Grant Still incorporated blues melodies and African-American spirituals in an original self-expressive twist on sonata form. Now, why do I say self-expressive? It is self-expressive because Still himself was African-American likely explaining why he was more successful in incorporating African-American elements into his music than Dvorak. Moreover, the Afro-American symphony took use of new and unique instrumentation, including the celeste and the tenor banjo. Now, in the brief time I have remaining, I want to talk about the future of symphonic music. While I was studying Beethoven's scores recently, I began to wonder, why aren't there any major symphonies nowadays? Really, why? But then it struck me that just as the Romantics were afraid to write symphonies after Beethoven's Ninth, musicians in 2020 must have a similar anxiety. Perhaps we are even more afraid because now you have Beethoven, Brahms, Mahler, and several others, all great composers. At the beginning of this lecture, I said that I've always wondered what it was like to be the already learned instead of the still learning. But the truth is that we are all still learning. The student yesterday becomes a teacher tomorrow, just as the teacher yesterday became the student today. And I believe that this is a universality which applies to every individual creative voice. The inspirational symphony imagined in the days long past most definitely can, and I think will be, reimagined in the time of the present. On that optimistic note, I leave you with my thanks and with my warmest affection. Thank you.